going to play the role of the judge. And this is more dire, which means on his face. And the purpose of this is that each side in a criminal case, they get challenges. You don't, they don't just have to have a jury. People that come in are prospective jurors. They're called the veneer. And um, they get to ask you questions. And based on how you answer them, each side gets a, a, what they call peremptory challenges, where they can kick you off for no reason. They'll just say, you know, Mr. Ben, Mr. Snugger, thank you for showing up. Appreciate your service. And you leave. And because um, they're going to try, the facts never change in the case. They're usually pretty well established. Every once we on TV, they show everything is, you know, the facts are in question. But that's not really reality. And so, and this is an actual case that I tried. So the facts, this is, Rick recognized it the minute he read the case scenario. This is Rick Calson, he's my law partner at the law firm. He's been an attorney for over 40 years. He's going to be great, but not me. So, uh, cases usually, on each side, there are problems. You know, there's proof problems, not enough evidence, you know, for sure conviction. A lot of cases are like that, and this is one of them. That's why they end up going to trial. If you have a really solid case, they'll take a plea mark. So you don't really, you know, if you have them with videotape of them doing something bad and a confession, typically those cases never go to trial. So the cases that you end up trying are always the ones that are on the fence. They go either way. And so this is one of those cases. I'll read you a little bit of the scenario of what this is. And then I get to go first on board Dyer. So what I'm doing is asking you but what I'm asking you is things that would exclude you statutorily. Certain people cannot serve on a jury. So I'll be asking you if you've ever been convicted of a felony. Are you a citizen of the United States? Things like that. Because by statute, if you, if you, there are things that will exclude you. And then I'll go through a list of the witnesses that will testify and the names of the attorneys and ask you if you know any of these people. And if you do, how do you know them? So we'll go through that little part. But that's all I'm worried about is things that would exclude you statutorily or that would cause some type of conflict, like you were friends with one of the attorneys. And you say if you recognize anybody, if you know any of the students, let us know. And then I'm done, because I don't really care about your opinions or whether you like police, you don't like police, you think police lie, you don't think police will ever lie. Whatever they ask you, just be honest with your answers. If that's the way you feel, that's the way you feel. I don't care. And um, they're going to try and pick out the ones that they want. And uh, at the end, I'll ask them, who would you exclude? And they're going to tell me. So they're going to come in and introduce themselves to you. You're going to introduce yourselves to them. And we'll go from there. Is that pretty simple? Okay. Juror number one, Josiah Martin. Could you stand up and introduce yourself, please? Yes. yes. Hi, my name is Josiah Martin. Juror number two, Claire Wells. My name is Claire Wells. Juror number three is Christopher Reeder. Hello, my name is Christopher Reeder. Juror number four is Matthew Redenbaugh. Hello, my name is Matthew Redenbaugh. No relation, by the way. Juror number five is Ben Snugger. My name is Ben Snugger. Juror number six is Matt Forrest. My name is Matt Forrest. Juror number seven is Jonathan Wagner. Jonathan Wagner. Juror number eight is Mr. Bodai. Jonathan Bodai. Jonathan Bodai. And juror number nine is Sean. Hi, Sean Thompson. Okay. If the attorneys would introduce themselves, the prosecution gets to go first. Uh, my name is Eric Sack, and I'm with the prosecution. And I'm Paul Palmer, and I'm with the defense. All right. Thank you for coming today and participating in this. Under civil duty, civic duty. Uh, this case involves a burglary where someone has crawled through a doggy door and was seen in the kitchen. The owner of the house saw them, uh, yelled, and ran to another room to call the police. And then during that time, that the alleged suspect fled through the doggy door. So that's the case. And he was located a couple blocks away by the uh, uh, an officer brought back to the scene and then uh, was identified by the victim. Uh, 
So that's where we're at today on this case. Uh, has any of you been convicted of a felony? Are all of you citizens of the United States? Does anybody here have an issue with um, being on the jury? Do you have some kind of medical ailment? Anything that would prevent you from serving on a jury? Anybody? Uh, do you, either one of you recognize the defense? Does anyone recognize the uh, prosecution? We have an Officer Smith that's going to testify. Does anyone know anybody on the police department? What's our suspect's name? <coughs> Oh, Dan Williams. Wait. Anyone knows Dan Williams? Okay. All right. If no one has an issue uh, with serving on a jury, then I will turn it over to the prosecution. Hello. Um, it is my job here to gather evidence that has been presented to me and basically presented to you, a jury. Um, this is an opportunity for me to ask you some questions and but basically take those responses in order to determine whether or not this is a case that you can serve on as a fair and impartial juror. So my first question is just for the general jury. Um, what type of evidence or facts would you like to hear in this case? And that would be circumstantial, physical, shaky, uh, depending on what time, uh, what <coughs> the circumstances were, time of day, uh, brightness in the kitchen, um, they actually got a good look, or did they just run away, so. Um, so then you would think that there are factors that can affect that yeah. acceptance of patients. Um, how do you feel, I'm going to pick on you again, how do you feel about judging the truthfulness of a witness? Do you think you could do that, or is it something that, again, you're a little um, um, so how many of you have been in situations where you had to listen to conflicting stories and decide which side to believe? And how did you reach that decision, basically? Listen to both sides. Oh. 
John, I also noticed that you put you kind of victim of a crime. Could you please elaborate on what happened? On either there? side or? Whatever you want to tell me. <laughs> uh, no, I, I haven't committed too many crimes. But, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, it's theft. Yeah. Um, cars being broken into. Are you guys able to bring your common sense and experiences in the courtroom when evaluating the evidence presented in this case? Basically, are you able to take the circumstances, um, also bring your common knowledge and your common sense in order to reach a conclusion? Yeah. Um, and is there anyone that has anything that you think it's important for me to know about in deciding whether or not you
If you um, were approached by a police officer on the street and asked several questions about what you were up to, would that make you nervous at all? No. No. Does anybody have a different opinion? Uh, I think it would depend on what questions he was asking. Okay. And also, John, um, in, the, in that one situation where you were pulled over and, uh, and, and false Um, how did how did you feel in that situation? Uh, did you feel nervous in that I situation? I was pretty nervous. On your um, on your questionnaire, that you have a dog for security. Is that dog an indoor dog or outdoor? Or both? Oh, yeah, a little bit of both. Sleeps so inside. Okay. okay. Do you have a doggy door on your house? Yeah. Do you have a, a way of securing that door? Yes, it has. Yep. Most of them have that little thing on there. Do you 
think that's a fair way of identifying somebody? Uh, yeah, I think so. You think so? Yeah. Okay. Is there anybody that's not familiar with the police lineup? Lining up several different possible um, people and uh, having a witness point out the one that they had seen or whatever. Does anybody feel that that isn't a fair way of, of um, identifying the person? I don't think it is because they're, they're probably more than likely going to pick the person that fits closest to, even if it's not to a T. Okay. But would you believe that possibly if you were brought maybe 20, 30 minutes later after you saw somebody do something, if you were brought that person, do you think that you would be able to identify, and if they were fit closely to the person that you saw, would you be able to identify for sure whether that was the exact same person or not? So you would kick Matt mm -hmm. and Bodai. Matt Force and Jonathan Bodai. Yeah. Okay. Who would you kick? First person I would kick would be Jonathan Wagner because he'd be likely too old to be a patient. Uh, and uh, the next person is um, was difficult as well. But I think I'd go with uh, Matthew Redenbaugh because he was seen to be the least outspoken and the most likely, even though he said he would voice his opinion. He was, um, if he, you know, if he disagreed, he seemed like he would be more of a follower. Just with his demeanor. Okay. All right, good enough. My name is Richard Radabaugh, and I'm going to be the judge of this case. Uh, some of the facts, you're here to listen to the facts on a burglary charge. We've had a, an individual charged with burglary because uh, a woman was home alone and suspect or somebody crawled through her doggy door, allegedly the defendant here, and uh, she saw him, yelled, and she went to another room to call the police, and when she got back, he was gone. Police arrived a little bit later and uh, found the defendant close by, brought the uh, victim over to where he was at, and she identified him, and that's why we're here. So that's the case. So first of all, I'm going to ask all of you, have any of you been convicted of a felony? Have any of you, are all of you American citizens, citizens of the United States? Uh, I'm going to ask the two attorneys to introduce themselves. Prosecution of the state is represented by... My name is Melissa Cutie, and I'm with the prosecution. I'm Daniel Fierro, and I'm on the, on the defensive side. Okay, does anyone know either one of the... Defendants. I mean, uh, the attorneys. The defendant's name in this case is Dan Williams. Does anyone know the defendant in this case? The officer that made the arrest is Smith. Officer Smith. Does anyone know any officer Smith? Okay. Does anyone know anything about this case other than what I just told you just now? You know, heard about it, read about it in the paper? Okay. Then I will turn this over to the prosecution. They'll be asking you some questions, and when she's done, uh, the defense will be asking you. Can you please introduce him? Oh, that, you're right, I was supposed to do that. <laughs> Juror number one, Josiah Marner, would you please stand up and introduce yourself? <laughs> Juror number two, Ms. Wells? Claire Wells. Juror number three, Christopher Rieger. Hello, my name is Christopher Rieger. Juror number four, Matthew Redenbaugh. Matthew Redenbaugh? No relation. He spells his name slightly different than I do. Juror number five, Ben. Snugger. 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 Juror number six, Matt Force. Matt Force. Juror number seven, Jonathan Bodai. Or Jonathan Wagner, I'm sorry. 
John Wagner. Juror number eight, John Bodine. John Bodine. And juror number nine, Sean. Sean Kalser. What is it? John Kalser. Okay, my name is Lissa Key, and we are here on behalf of the people of El Paso County in Colorado to seek justice. We are going through the process called Quadir. The objective is looking for the most fair and impartial jury we can find for the people and for the defendant. We are looking for complete honesty and openness. If you feel a certain way, that's totally fine. Please speak up. We want to know. So, first of all, I would like to know from Josiah, how can you tell when someone is telling you the truth or not telling you the truth? Um, well, depending on certain facial features, you can tell if they're nervous and that kind of things, or if their story doesn't line up with what they're saying. Okay, so nonverbal cues, body language, kind of a variety of different yeah. things that would kind of allude to the fact that they're not being truthful. Uh, how many of you have children? Okay. How do you know your kids aren't telling you the truth, Sean? <laughs> uh, well, we can't speak yet, so... Oh, okay. Well, then never mind. <laughs> if they could, what are common features of a child lying to you? Uh, just anxiousness, you know, jumpy, um, you know, not making eye contact. Or coming up with more elaborate stories, yeah. or running and hiding, or yeah. general anxiety. A lot of body language anxiety with kids. Yeah. Okay. Um, how many of you live alone or have a female family member that lives alone, like mom or sister? <laughs> okay. Do you feel more worry for them because they live alone? Yes. Do they have any kind of protection as far as like a weapon or a dog or alarm system? Uh, pepper spray. Okay. Okay. Do you feel like she's adequately protected? Okay. Would you, do you think she would be able to respond or react to something happening while she were alone? Uh, probably depending on what situation. situation but okay. How many of you like crime TV shows? And anything from CSI to NCIS or whatever. Um, who agrees with me that those shows are for entertainment purposes and not actual reality, okay? Does anyone feel like they could s separate the two between, you know, I'm not maybe going to have a lab full of evidence or some kind of crazy state-of-the-art fingerprint situation? Does anyone disagree with that? Okay. Who would want to see physical evidence like fingerprints or DNA or footprints or something quite physical taken from the crime scene. Would you need that to convict? Okay. What if there was an eyewitness account? Would that sway you in one way or another? So would an eyewitness account outweigh evidence? No? Okay. How much proof do you need to see? Would it be a certain number of witnesses or a certain number of experts that you would want to see on the stand? I think it's the quality of the evidence and the testimony, not the quantity. Okay, that's fair. Does anyone else have anything they want to add or change? Okay. What, if evidence-wise, I have X, Y, and Z today, would you be willing to convict? If I have physical evidence of X, Y, and Z, pretty much anything, or, but I don't have, I'm trying to think if I can learn this. If I have X, Y, and Z, but what if I only had X and Y and A? Would that change the sequence? Would that change how you feel about the evidence? Has anyone ever gotten a speeding ticket? Okay. Claire, what was your experience with that? Did you feel like it was fair or? I was speeding. Yeah? Yeah, I was late for a, um, something important. But the um, 
officer also wrote two warnings for me, which I know doesn't count towards my record, but for things that didn't exist, like something about my license plate not being like lit, atta no, <laughs> attached to my car in a proper way or something. Okay. So that kind of brought me a long way. But I've also had really good experiences with okay. police officers as well. Do you think that would sway how you would react in this case with law enforcement? No, that was just one individual overall. Okay. Does anyone else have any good or bad experiences with law enforcement? I mean, when I got caught speeding, the person held me down for like an hour and a half to uh, interrogate me to see if I was drunk or on drugs. I was just tired. Okay. So it was a little inappropriate. Okay. It's just one experience. Okay. So do you feel like law enforcement can be fair in general? Yes. Okay. So that wouldn't sway how you feel about the case or how you would feel about the law enforcement officer in the case? Okay. How can you tell between a crime and a mistake? Whether or not the person that committed the crime or the mistake feels guilty about it or whether or not they have bad intentions. Okay. So intent. Yes. Okay. Does anyone else have anything that they want to add or would change to that? Okay, so intent would be a really strong factor, whether it was just a simple mistake or an actual crime. Okay. If you go to bed and it's no snow, totally dry out, and you wake up in the morning and there's snow on the ground, what could you reasonably assume? That it snowed overnight? Yeah. How could you assume that? Based on the fact that there was snow and how it is, it's got to get there somehow. Okay. So you could reasonably assume that it snowed after you went to bed, even though you didn't see it happen. Okay. Does anyone else have anything that they would want to add to that or feel any differently about that? Okay. What if I told you I have a red object behind my back? Would you be able to guess what it was? No? Okay. What if I told you it was red and brown? Would that get you any closer? Okay. What if I told you it was red, brown, and a fruit? Would that limit your ideas a little bit more? You're, you're asking if we would be 100% confident? Yes. Okay. Or if you could comfortably, reasonably find a conclusion of knowing what it would be. Okay, so what if I told you it was red, brown, a fruit, and a primary ingredient in America's favorite pie? Could you reasonably deduce what fruit that was? No, maybe a tomato or not. Okay. <laughs> it's a terrible pie. <laughs> it has to be a fruit. Well, I guess a tomato is a fruit. That's fair. All right, does anyone else feel any differently about that? Could you come up with a different conclusion? Does anyone else think it would be an apple? Like, no questions asked. Based on the things that I gave you. Strawberry. Okay. Alright. What is your favorite hobby? Does anyone have a favorite hobby that they like to do? Working on my car. Okay. Anybody else?
investigator, criminal. Christopher? Uh, I'm 19. I don't, want, I don't know what I want to do. Matthew? I'm 20, and I want to become a homicide detective. Ben? I'm 19, and I either want to be an attorney or work in law enforcement. Okay. Matt, four seconds. I'm 20 and I want to be a police officer. Jonathan Wagner. I'm 20 and I want to be a detective. Okay. I'm not a detective. What about the other gentleman? Right here. Uh, 26 and I want to be a game warden. Okay. Again, what? Game warden. Oh. Okay. And then Sean. I'm 24 and like I figured it out, but now. Being in this class, I might want to do uh, a lot of group stuff. Yeah. Alrighty, so I'm gonna start with uh, Josiah. Which one? Uh, Alright, so do you believe our criminal justice system is perfect? <coughs> no. Okay. Alright, let's go. Let's say there is a murder in town. What would be some evidence that you would look for to be able to convict someone? Oh, uh, physical. Physical evidence. Would you say hearsay evidence would be enough to convict that individual or not? No? When confronting a police officer, do you believe nervousness is a sign of guilt? No. No? What is your opinion on individuals that are wrongfully convicted? Have you ever been a victim of a crime? No. Alright, move down to Claire. Do you know anyone that has been wrongfully convicted? I don't. What is your opinion on gang members? Do you think all of them are bad? for five seconds, what would be the first things do you remember about that person? Their face. Their face? Mm -hmm. Anything else? Height. Height. Hair color. Hands. What shoes they're wearing. Do you, what do you think of physical evidence when solving a crime? When solving a crime, do you believe that is important? I think it's really important, but um, I think that it's also important to look at other aspects. Statement, do you agree with, uh, do you agree with Mark? You are guilty until, until proven innocent, or you are innocent until proven guilty? You are innocent until proven Thank you. Moving on to Christopher. Have you ever been questioned or had an interaction with police officers in your lifetime? Yes. Did you get nervous? Not really. No? Can you tell me more about that experience? Well, it was just a routine traffic stop. I had a light out. I knew I had a light out. He knew it. And it was over in 15 minutes. No big deal. And besides that, nothing else? Okay. Um, do you follow crime stories or criminal cases in the news? No. Do you belong to any clubs? Do you have any relatives or close friends who are lawyers or who have attended law school? No. Are you planning to apply for law enforcement? Or are you either a detective or a detective? Oh, what is your opinion on hearsay evidence? Say that again. What is your opinion on hearsay evidence? Hearsay? Yeah. Do you know what that is? I don't know what that is. <laughs> so, uh, just basically, like, uh, what do you say, an opinion, what do you say? Hearsay evidence is like their own. The opinion. legal definition for hearsay is an out-of-court statement used for the truth of the matter asserted. Okay. Thank you. 
<laughs> so basically, it's an out of court statement that's used in court. Um, I would say that really depends. Like Daniel doesn't have a law degree, so I'll explain it to you. <laughs> it's a statement that's impossible to cross examine. Someone uh, told me, so I'm telling you what they told me. He uh, said, okay. So, Alyssa, I'm just, we're breaking this just so I can give you a little explanation. Daniel, to be fair to Daniel, because he, he's not a lawyer. But I can say, Alyssa told me she robbed the bank. And then you ask me, you're a lawyer, you're cross examining me, you go, well, what was she wearing that day? I don't know, she didn't say. Well, what kind of gun did she use? I don't know, she didn't say. So, you see why you can't. Oh, yeah. It cannot be cross-examined. That's why hearsay is generally inadmissible. So that's what the hearsay is. To revert the question, uh, would you say that hearsay evidence is enough to convict an, convict an individual? Or? Uh, no. No? Okay, moving on to, I don't know, still one more time. Uh, well, 10,000 individuals are wrongfully convicted per year according to a study. What do you think is one reason? I it's a number of factors, you know, like uh, misinterpreted evidence, for example, could be one. Ben? Do you believe that some police officers often brainwash the victims of the crime to be able to get a conviction or an on anyone? For example, given your father's same identification? I believe that it has happened, but I feel like it's a very rare occurrence. Would you be able to clearly identify an individual in the dark if you saw that person for, let's say, five seconds? I think it could be difficult. I think I could distinguish, distinguish some distinct features, but you know, all of them. And again, which ones would you, would you look for? I'd probably look for your sex, race, height, uh, 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 some facial features if I can get them what they're wearing. Do you know anyone that has been wrongfully convicted? No. no? And same question, question as Claire. What's your opinion on gang members? Do you think all of them are bad or not? From my understanding, no. A lot of them are pressured into that situation almost to the point where they don't really have an option. So, they do bad things, but they might not be bad people. Moving on to Jonathan. Yeah. Have you ever been, have you ever had an interaction with a police officer? I uh, have. Yeah. Can you elaborate on that? Uh, Was it a good one, bad one? Been pulled over uh, a couple times. Um, all of them. Uh, I mean, pretty fair. I mean, I was speeding. Um, I, I was pulled over one time for. My vehicle was supposedly involved in, in a robbery, and it was it fit the description, and so I was pulled over, um, and uh, I was arrested, and they searched my car, but then they let me go. So, did you get nervous when all that was happening? Yeah, I did. You did. Mm -hmm. uh, Steve Sean. Charged with a crime or been the subject of a criminal investigation? Yes. Yeah. Can you elaborate as well? Um, public fighting two times. Public what? Public fighting. Oh, public fighting. Uh, disturbing the peace. Um, issues with licenses, license plates, registration. <laughs> but no felonies, just misdemeanors. Okay. 
Did you get a nervous? A couple times, yeah. Because I was, I was a kid in most of those situations. You know, there's a lot of intimidation. And, um, but, yeah, as you get older, I think it, uh, it's, it's a lot easier to understand what's going on. Okay. Sure, can you be excused for a few minutes? You guys have any questions before we go? Who got picked? Yeah. You got picked. Who got this ball? In fact, you were so bad that both sides <laughs> 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 can, can you tell can you elaborate on that?
you would have to, and they, even the prosecution made the argument when I motioned to dismiss the burglary charge, made the argument, well, you can assume that he was there. I said, you know, you have to have evidence, something, even circumstantial evidence, that he was going to do this. And so the judge dismissed the burglary charge. But if I had a jury, I felt more confident that I would be able to, to uh, get him acquitted and everything. But like I said, the judge has the ability to look up his record while he's sitting on the bench. And I know he did it. And this guy, this was his third burglary. At 17. So, anyways. So it's an actual case. But what did you think? Were you felt comfortable with these questions? Did you guys feel and you could tell where they were going with this stuff? Good. But you guys did great, and I just appreciate it. And I know my students up there appreciate it. And uh, this is a very important part of the jury trial. Rick who's probably tried well into the double digits or triple digits of cases. will tell you that jury selection is where you win the case. You pick the right jury, and uh, you know your chances of success at trial, whatever side you're on. And you may not believe in your client. You may think that he is guilty, or he may have told you he's guilty. But as a defense attorney, you have an obligation, a sworn obligation, to give him the best defense possible. And if you're representing the people or the state, your obligation is not to convict somebody wrongly, but to present the facts in the most likely way to succeed and let the jury decide. You, know, you still have to do justice even if you're a prosecutor.